Theistic Evolution Critique, Human Uniqueness. We've been looking at the book uh, Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. And um, um, there are three parts, and we're still in the first part, uh, the second section of the human, uh, first part. But before we go any further, I should point out that there are several ways of dealing with uh, the, ho the story of humanity and the story of hum uh, life on Earth. And one of them is that you believe in young life creation, various flavors of that. But um, the other one is what is commonly called Old Earth, which should be renamed Old Life Creation. Um, a third one is an ID-friendly theistic evolution, where uh, it really is evolution, but it is God-guided, and you can tell. The fourth one is non-intelligent design theistic evolution, where either God guided it in such a way that you can't tell, or God didn't guide it at all. He set up the process, and it gave us uh, who we are today. Um, and those two are waffled on by uh, the people who are in that position. And finally, there is, of course, atheistic evolution. This book is not actually aimed at atheistic evolution. It's clearly aimed, and says so in a number of different places, at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. But as we'll see today, we're starting to get into an area where ID theistic evolution might uh, become a little uncomfortable. Uh, the chapter we're dealing with today is authored by Ann Gager, Ola Hoster, um, and Colin Reeves. And um, it's in part one, as I said, the scientific crit critique of theistic evolution. And it's in section two, the case against universal common descent and for a unique human origin. It's in section two of part two, which is uh, for a unique human origin. And this one is entitled Evidence for Human Uniqueness. You may remember last week we had um, the uh, our, uh, fossil evidence. And this week we're going to talk about genetic evidence for human uniqueness. There's a quote that should be kept in mind in terms of what makes us human. It's not the things that are the same. It is the things that are different that matter. The summary of the uh, talk is that scientists claim that our extreme genetic similarity with chimps on the order of 98.7% identity indicates we share common ancestry. This statement neglects several facts. First, our genetic differences are larger than that number represents. It's not really 99%. Uh, second, common estimates of similarity are based on comparisons of the single nucleotide changes only, while other kinds of genetic differences are regarded. In addition, non-coding regions of DNA, long thought to be non-functional junk, contain many kinds of genetic regulatory elements, some of which are species-specific. These species-specific regulatory elements make up a very small por proportion of the total count of the difference, but have a significant effect on how our genome works. And the control regions are the most important ones. For example, many of these regulatory elements are known to affect gene expression in the brain, which is one of our major differences from chimpanzees. Um, this is uh, chapter 15, I think. Um, let me uh, make sure of that. If I'm wrong, let me know. Yeah, because this is... Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's... Uh, yeah. Maybe 14. Uh, it's, it's 15. Uh, this is, okay, here it is, yeah. Yeah, it's 15. It is 15. Okay. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> taken together, these species-specific genetic differences contribute to our anatomical and physiological differences with chimps. 
In addition, there is not enough evolutionary time for all these coordinated changes to have happened by the mutation selection process. Thus, the evidences for common ancestry put forward by various sciences are not as solid as they might seem. The more we learn about our, human gen our own human genome, the more it seems to be brilliantly and uniquely designed. Introduction. In 2007, Science Magazine published an essay entitled Relative Differences, The Myth of 1% by John Cohen. The essay challenged the received knowledge of our culture that we are genetically nearly identical with chimpanzees. Cohen detailed how our genetic differences are significantly higher than 1%, but this news did not penetrate the culture. Numerous articles, books, newspapers, and TV science shows still use the 1% figure. Even the major scientific journal of science used it as recently as 2012. The underlying concept that gives this figure its persistence is common descent. This concept is something that most biologists treat as axiomatic, untouchable, and completely self-evident, which is why the figure of 1% has such staying power. Even if they disagree with the neo-Darwinian account of evolution, and some scientists do, see chapter 8, most scientists, including most theistic evolutionists, still accept our common ancestry with chimpanzees. The question at hand then concerns the steps that supposedly took us from being ape-like to being human. Are we fancy apes with all the evolutionary baggage that comes along with that? Or are we unique beings with capabilities far beyond the reach of animal species? Because we do not have access to much information about our supposed common ancestor with chimps, we will address this question by examining how we differ from chimps in our genetics, physiology, anatomy, and more. Definitions. Before we begin, we need to define a few basic terms. Others will be defined as we go along. And I'm not going to, most of you, I think, know the definition of DNA and even nucleotides. DNA expression, just briefly, when DNA is copied into RNA and used to make something, we say that it has been expressed just as reading a text out of loud can be said to be expressing the text, as I'm doing right now. Um, chromosomes, uh, most of you know, long strings of DNA. Um, uh, SNPs, uh, when DNA is compared between two copies of a chromosome from different individuals, or maybe five different copies, in fact, um, uh, differences are usually found. Often they are single nucleotide changes, as in figure 15.2, and we'll show that in a minute, and are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and the reason for that complicated name is because the name is intended not to be telling you which one deviated. You don't know what the original was. You just know that they're different from each other, so if they were once the same, then one of them had to change. And there's our uh, figure, and you'll notice that one, uh, uh, one base has changed. In this case, it's a T. In this case, it's a C. And uh, correspondingly, that has had to change to a G, and that has had to change uh, to an A. Which one was original? You can't tell. Uh, is it A or B? Uh, and so it's a polymorphism. Um, a gene, a gene is defined as DNA that carries information about how to make one or more proteins or RNAs. That's the best definition of gene you're going to find f uh, in a long time because we're finding out that, that it's not necessarily for proteins. RNA, I'll leave that out, amino acids and proteins. I'm hoping most of you know that. Um, protein translation DNA carries the information for how to make proteins, but the information carried in DNA needs to be interpreted in the cell. DNA is to be copied, sometimes known as transcribed, into RNA, or expressed, and then it is translated into protein. Copying DNA into RNA and then translating into protein is like translating the information in one language, the nucleotide sequence of the DNA, into another language, the amino acid sequence that makes a protein. The genetic code, uh, most of you may know this, but just for review, the genetic code determines how the DNA is, to turn, is turned into protein. Each set of three particular nucleotides, such as AAA, AAC, AAT, AAG, ATA, ATC, and so forth, are, are examples, they specify one particular amino acid. 
uh, AAA, for example, is transcribed into UUU in, uh, uh, which is corresponding to TTT in uh, RNA, and then that's transcribed into phenylalanine, which is not related to uh, that other than that it, that's what the code says. Um, there are roughly 20 amino acids and 64 possible nucleotide triplets called codons that specify for them. Because of this, most amino acids are specified by more than one codon. Said another way, a DNA string contains the information for making protein in the form of a digital code made up of triplet nucleotides. This code must be read and translated in order to make a protein. 1% um, similarity, sequencing the genome. Chimpanzees are our closest living relatives according to standard evolutionary theory. It is assumed by the scientific establishment that we can look at their behavior, physiology, and genetics in order to learn both how we are the same and what makes us different. We can compare genomes, the whole complement of an organism's DNA, to find out which genes were crucial in making us who we are. We can identify differences in our DNA that perhaps make us prone to disease or discover genes that may protect against disease. This was the rationale for sequencing the chimpanzee genome, and the project was done in two, begun in 2003, shortly after our own genome sequence was published. Because of the sequencing process is prone to errors, each read of the sequence needed to be done multiple times. The preferred standard is at least 12-fold redundancy. Each nucleotide must be read at least 12 times. But the published chimpanzee genome has only a 3.6-fold sequence redundancy, which is problematic for determining which SNPs are genuine and which are errors in the sequencing process. You do it 12 times, you get uh, 10 times the one and two times the other. Well, you can pretty much figure that the 10 times is probably more accurate. Um, <clears throat> Because of this low redundancy, the published chimpanzee genome sequence is referred to as a draft genome, not a definitive one. Even the canonical human genome sequence, which was read that way, uh, completed in 2003, continues to be refined and annotated. Nevertheless, the consortium that sequenced the chimpanzee genome claimed that the sequence reads were high quality and could be used for analysis. We must await another chimpanzee genome sequence assembled de novo, that is, without a human scaffold, with higher multiplicity to know for sure. What do they mean by that? It's basically when you get uh, a sequence, it needs to align somewhere on the chromosome, and you don't know where. But if you assume that the chimpanzee is pretty much like the human uh, chromosome, then you can say, well, it must belong here because it matches a human. Well, it would be a lot nicer if you did it all by itself without consideration of what the human was because maybe the chimpanzee has rearranged at some point. And uh, uh, we found out that, for example, in the Y chromosome, it made a huge difference whether you tried to assemble it on a human scaffold or not. Comparing genomes, in the paper reporting the first sequence, the estimates for the percentage of SNPs in the human genome that differ when compared to the chimpanzee genome is 1.23%, which is, you know, 98.7%, not, not too bad. 1.08% um, when variation between humans is taken into account. This low percentage difference is one of the reasons it is claimed that we share common ancestry with chimpanzees. At this level, we appear very similar. But there are other kinds of differences between chimpanzee and human DNA. Insertions and deletions add 2 to 4%. Different studies use different samples and techniques of this variation in numbers, not surprising. Differences also exist between chimpanzee and human DNA in the number and location of repeating genetic elements. About 0.4% of the genome is comprised of repetitive genetic elements unique to humans, according to the Chimpanzee Sequencing Consortium. So you're not going to find them in the chimpanzee. Uh, in addition, and by the way, they're not counted in that 99%. In addition, the Y chromosome of chimpanzees and human males are very different from each other. The Y chromosome represents 1.8% of the genome. Those of you who have been here before may remember that um, we've gone over that Y chromosome, and it's a huge difference. Among protein uh, coding genes, copy number variations represent a large number of differences. Human sequences may have two or more copies of particular genes, while chimpanzees have only one, for example. And in the Y chromosome, it turns out the other way sometimes. 
according to DeMuth et al., our results imply that humans and chimpanzees differ by at least 6%. 1,418 uh, of uh, 22,000 genes in their complement of genes. Now, that's in the complement of genes themselves, in, which stands in stark contrast to the off-sided 1.5% differences between orthologous nucleotide sequences. This genoming revolving, genomic revolving door of gene gain and loss represents a large number of genetic differences separating humans from our closest friends. So already we're down to 94% identity instead of 99. All told, based on our current knowledge, there is at least a 5% difference in our DNA, and that does not count rearrangements in the DNA, where segments of the DNA appear flipped end-to-end -end in relationship to chimp DNA, or where one segment of the human DNA is in a different location than in the chimpanzees. In truth, though, counting raw differences is not the best way to calculate how different we are genetically speaking. And there are several reasons why it is not surprising that we share 95% of our DNA sequence with chimps. First, our basic building blocks, the proteins out of which our cells are made and the enzymes that carry out cellular metabolism, are very similar to those of chimps, almost identical in many cases. Second, the vast majority of our DNA does not code for protein, but functions like an operating system, determining which, what files or genes should be used when and where, including during embryogenesis. The routine processes of life are carried out by this operating system, and we share these basic routines with chimps. Thus, in many respects, our operating systems are the same as those of chimps. Last, it is the things that are different that matter. As we will show, small sections of DNA can make, have a large effect on how things come together. Differences in how our DNA is used. Back in the 1970s, when people were first beginning to get the idea that the human genome and the chimpanzee genome were very similar, despite our obvious anatomical, physiological, and behavioral differences, Mary Claire King and A.C. Wilson proposed, that the difference that ma differences that matter might not be in the sequence of the DNA, but how it is put to use. And skipping over a little bit of material, human-specific differences in gene regulation, as we shall say, are what make us unique. Human-specific genes. We have 20,000 or so genes. We now know that some are unique to us. Estimates vary as to how many. One report says there are about 300 human-specific protein coding genes, mainly due to, uh, due to new duplications of existing genes. Another re paper reports over 600. What that means is that those 600 genes are, are in a sense, brand new. They, they shouldn't count as matches to chimps. These new genes have been linked to disease, meaning their overexpression or underexpression can affect the progress of disease. They tend to be expressed in the brain and the testis, as many as 60 de novo genes, not arising by duplication of existing genes, but genuinely new, have also been reported. 60 brand new genes between chi humans and chimps. These genes may also be uh, disease-associated also, meaning they're likely to have function. You don't have them, something goes wrong. It is worth noting that even one novel functional gene is a remarkable thing from an evolutionary point of view. It used to be accepted that getting new genes was very hard, but now new genes are being found in every genome that is sequenced. Genes that appear to be unique to that species. This was a surprise for evolutionary biologists. Uh, surprise is a very mild word in this case. Um, from a design point of view, however, the, the existence of new genes for each species makes sense. Multipurpose genes. It was discovered in the late 1970s that protein-coding genes can be used to encode many different proteins. The genes that are broken up into segments called exons, and after the genes have been transcribed into RNA, the RNA can be spliced into different arrangements of exons. Say a gene has exons 1 through 5. The RNA can be spliced into exons 1 and 2, or 2, 3, and 4, or 1, 3, and 4, or 4 and 5, for example. And there's an example of four different there's one and two, two, three and four, four and five, one, skip one, and get uh, three, four and five. And of course, you can go the other way sometimes, not always. There can also be genes expressed in the opposite direction, for example, five, three and two. So although we have only about 20,000 genes, we have potentially many thousands of different protein coding RNAs made from these genes. 
with each unique RNA making a different protein. There is an important role for alternative splicing in establishing differences between humans and chimpanzees, one study reports. In fact, 6 to 8% of genes that have been studied display splicing differences between chimps and humans. That means that our genes may be used to make different proteins even though they appear to have the same DNA sequence. Differential gene expression. Different tissues and organs in the body are made of specific cell types, and each cell type expresses its own set of genes. The pattern of expression of genes uh, affects what kind of cell it becomes. It follows that in order for us to develop into humans and not chimpanzees, it is likely that differences in gene expression are evolved are involved. Significantly, there are substantial differences in gene expression between humans and chimpanzees, particularly in the brain. There are multiple kinds of elements involved in regulating differential gene expression. The most well-known are protein transcription factors, roughly 1 to 3 percent of them human-specific. The transcription factors recognize and bind to particular DNA, DNA binding sites and influence the activity of their neighboring genes. Some increase gene expression, some decrease it. One to three percent of our transcription factors are unique to us. Non-coding DNA and its functions. Only about two percent of our genome carries the information to make protein, an astonishing fact. The remainder is non-coding and does not specify how to, how to make protein. Roughly half of that non-coding DNA is composed of repeating elements, sometimes called mobile genetic elements. Many of these repeating elements resemble a certain kind of viral DNA that can copy itself and insert into new locations in the genome, though most of these mobile genetic elements are inactive. For a number of years, many scientists assumed that the non-protein coding DNA was junk, the detritus of evolution. This is based on the idea that mobile elements had copied and inserted themselves into new locations, accumulating over time, and elements that had become broken were inefficiently removed. We now know that at least some of this junk DNA is involved in modulating the behavior and structure of the chromosomes, regulating the expression of genes, as well as perhaps providing ways for organisms to respond to their environments genetically, as will be discussed below. The change in view is as exemplified by the about face and junk DNA by Francis Collins. As Marvin Olasky reports at World Magazine, Collins claimed on page 136 of his book, The Language of God, that Huge chunks of our genome are littered with ancient repetitive elements, those jumping genes we were talking about, so that roughly 45% of the human genome is made up of such genetic flotsam and jetsam. In a talk given in New York, he claimed that existence of junk DNA was proof that man and mice had a common ancestor because God would not have created men with useless genes. Last year, though, speaking at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco, Collins threw in the towel. In terms of junk DNA, we don't use that term anymore because I think it was pretty much a case of hubris to imagine that we could dispense with any part of the genome as if we knew enough to say it wasn't functional. Most of the genome that we used to think was there for spacer turns out to be doing stuff. We should be clear, though, Collins has not given up his position that chimps and humans have a common ancestor. It's just that he doesn't use that argument. We've focused below on specific kinds of junk DNA because they make up a large portion of our genome and have in many cases been shown to have function. And uh, they talk about signs and lines. Short interspersed nuclear elements, or signs, are a type of mobile genetic element that represents about 12% of the genome. Among other things, signs help to specify in which cells genes should be expressed. 7,000 ALUs, which is a kind of sign, are species-specific, present in humans but not in chimpanzees. Human-specific ALU elements, as they are called, are also involved in RNA editing. This sign-induced RNA editing is most notable in the human brain and is largely species-specific. Of course, the brain is one of the areas where we differ most from chimpanzees, but RNA editing is not just in the brain. It is essential for development, and improper editing results in diseases like cancer and psychiatric disorders. Other mobile uh, genetic elements, called long interspersed genetic elements, or lines, are about 17% of the genome. Many, about 
1800 are specific, species specific. They have a role in regulating the way chromosomes behave, where they cluster in the nucleus, how they are packed, and they inhibit gene expression, which sometimes can be useful. Lines also help dif uh, direct different kinds of cells to develop in the brain. Lines move to new locations in the genome of particular brain cells as they develop, landing near different genes involved in neuronal development. That means many of our brain cells literally rewrite the genetic instructions during the process of becoming mature neurons. The same is true in other tissues of the body as well. Skipping a paragraph, non-long coding RNA, 70 to 90 percent of the genome is transcribed into RNA but does not produce any protein. Called long non-coding RNAs, or LNC RNAs, these RNAs can be nested within genes going in either direction or they can come from DNA with no protein coding genes. They often originate from or contain signs and lines. These RNAs tend to be species specific. Overexpression can lead to diseases such as cancer. Human accelerated regions, or HARs, are human DNA segments whose sequences differ substantially from related mammalian sequences. The mammalian sequences are conserved, meaning that they differ very little among species. Chimpanzee may, may look very much like rat. Yet the human HARs are quite different. Interestingly, these HARs are, tend to be located near developmental genes, transcription factors, and genes expressed in the central nervous system. So some of them have to do with brain function. More differences. All non-human primates, in fact, most mammals, carry endemic infectious retroviruses, a kind of virus that integrates itself into the host genome in order to replicate itself. There are two kinds, simian foamy viruses and simian infectious retroviruses that are shared among most human primates. Among humans, we have only the newly introduced HIV and human T leukemia virus and no others. That is, human HIV is probably coming from a simian infectious retrovirus that got mutated. If we were descended from a common ancestral population with chimpanzees, we should carry the SAV and SFV viruses also, but we don't. The organization of our DNA sequence differs considerably. Genetic nef networks, transcription factors, signs, lines, and uh, uh, long, long non-coding RNAs all act as re to regulate genes in a sort of genetic network of interactions. The genome as an operating system. If the genome sounds complicated, it is. It needs to be complicated in order to enable the timing and location of different gene expression. We may share 95% or even 99% of our DNA sequence with chimpanzees, but it's how the DNA is used that matters. Thus, one can say that our genome functions like a very complex operating system, more complex than anything we've ever built. Our genome and its coordinated expressions are a wonder of intricacy, responsiveness, and beauty, far, far more sophisticated than anything we have dreamed of. Looking down into the depths of that complexity is truly dizzying, leaving one with a sense of awe. Physiological and anatomical differences. Given all the genetic differences and regulatory complexity described above, it should come as no surprise that our physiology and anatomy is different from that of chimpanzees. We do not have the same reproductive biology. Our teeth develop more slowly after birth than chimpanzees' teeth do, and our young are born profoundly helpless and require prolonged maternal care. Um, and then it details in the, the rest of that paragraph, brains, musculature, thyroid hormone metabolism, AIDS and malaria, immune systems, intestines, tears, which the chimps don't have, or at least not the ability to cry, swimming, diving reflexes, chins, walking and running, feet in the next paragraph, feet, necks, skull, rib cages, shoulders, pelvis and hip, legs, Inner ear canals, hands, smell, tactile sensitivity, fine motor control, and thumbs, just to name a few. Finally, there are all the cultural and behavioral differences. We plan. We think about the past and the future. We make intentional decisions. We can delay gratification for long periods. We engage in long-range trade. Adults play. We dance. We make music. We have language and communicate symbolically. And we write novels and poetry. 
We have mathematics and art. We domesticate animals and engage in agriculture. We wear clothing. We engage in hospitality. We control fire and we measure time. We practice religion and bury the dead. We have empathy for others and altruism on a scale unknown in the animal world. We care for the infirm and the elderly. Skipping a couple of other paragraphs, the most striking trait that distinguishes us from chimpanzees in our, is our intellect. There is no evolutionary explanation for its appearance. Barkey et al. state, it is difficult to explain how conventional natural selection could have selected ahead of time for the remarkable capabilities of the human mind which we are still continuing to explore today. An example is writing, which was invented long after the human mind evolved. Um, depends on your perspective, but okay. And continues to be modified and utilized in myriad ways. Explanations based on exaptation, the adaptation of a trait initially used for some other purpose, seem inadequate, as most of what the human mind routinely does today did not even exist at the time it was originally evolving. Experts in human evolution or cognition have yet to provide a truly satisfactory explanation. Skipping a few more paragraphs. Clearly, many mutations would have had to occur together simultaneously to accomplish the kind of coordinated changes necessary for our evolution. They could not have been just any mutations, for by themselves or in the wrong combinations, they would have been deleterious or even fatal, thus wiping out any progress. Time enough for change? Let's ask the question then, how long would it take to acquire a specific mutation or even two mutations to accomplish a particular anatomical change? The general assumption by population geneticists is that mutations arise at a regular rate, although oh, this may not be true. Once a mutation has occurred in one individual, it must spread through the population over succeeding generations to make a lasting change in the species. When the mutation is finally the only version of a particular gene in the population, we say the mutation has become fixed in the population. How long does this process take depends on several factors. The first is whether the mutation is beneficial by itself or not. Second, the size of the population matters. Third, the generation time also is important. Finally, of course, the mutation rate itself has an important effect. When these factors are taken into account, it is possible to build the mathematical models to estimate how long it would take a particular kind of mutation to appear. The estimates of these factors most commonly given by population geneticists are that we supposedly came from a population of about 10,000 with a generation time of 10 years. Apes have shorter generation times than we do. And a mutation rate of 10 to the minus 8 mutations, that's 1 in 100 million per base per generation at the time we last shared common ancestry with chimpanzees. A number of mathematicians and biologists have used these or similar estimates to calculate the length of time it would take to obtain a binding site in the DNA within 1,000 bases of some gene in order to change its gene expression. The reason for this calculation is it is assumed that changing a binding site in the DNA would change gene expression and thus change that individual's behavior and anatomy in some way. The mutation would then need to spread through the population and become fixed. Here's the problem. To get a single mutation in a DNA binding site and have it become fixed, would take anywhere from 1.5 million years to 6 million years, depending on whose calculations are used. 6 million years is, of course, the, the division between chimps and humans. Um, if two mutations are needed to get a change in behavior anatomy, it would take approximately between 84 and 216 million years, again, the, once again, depending on whose calculations are used. Other research using different methods merely confirm the problem and their references for that. Yet we only have 6 million years since we supposedly diverged from chimps. Uh, 12 million if you count from the common ancestor. That's it. And most beneficial traits will require more mutations than just one. If even one essential trait required two specific coordinated mutations, the evolutionary process would stall completely. Because 216 million years is too long to wait. The neo-Darwinian process cannot accomplish what is needed to explain our origin in the time available. Does similarity indicate common descent? We've ruled out the Darwinian mechanism as being sufficient to account for our origin, but we have not addressed the question of common descent, namely, could a designer have used the evolutionary process to make human beings? This is attacking ID-friendly theistic evolution. 
We already know that it would have been would have had to have been a guided process. Of, you know, skip theistic evolution at this point. Because of the problem of the amount of time required to accumulate all the necessary coordinated mutations. So now the question is, do we indeed share common ancestry with chimpanzees? In this section, we will examine several arguments that are typically made by evolutionary biologists in support of common descent and consider the responses of design biologists. Assumptions. Before we examine the evidence, though, it should be mentioned that there are some basic differences between the way evidence is approached by evolutionary biologists and by design biologists. The chief com assumption made by evolutionary biologists is that the genetic changes responsible for evolutionary change are random, and therefore, if a group of species share a trait in common that is not found in other related species, it is presumed that the common ancestor of the group developed that trait, and they all shared it because of common descent. On the other hand, if genetic change is directed rather than random, the trait is most likely shared because the organisms use similar solutions to a physiologic need. This beautifully explains convergent evolution, such as the ears of bats and whales, where unrelated organisms share a trait in common. Arguments used to support common descent. Pseudogenes. Pseudogenes have not received much attention in the scientific literature because they are assumed to be junk, but that is changing rapidly. Where pseudogenes have been carefully studied, they're often found to be functional and in some non-standard ways. There are several ways in which pseudogenes have been found to work so far. If they do have a function in both chimpanzees and humans that is highly dependent on their precise sequences, the similarity between chimpanzee and human sequences would not be surprising. They could be performing the same function, requiring the same sequence in both genomes. As an example, a pseudogene in the beta globin cluster, a cluster of genes in humans shows evidence of similar sequence similarity within and between the humans and chimpanzee populations. The similarity is not due to protein coding, but appears to involve regulation of developmental changes via chromosomal interactions. Sintani refers to how well chromosomal sequences from different species align with one another, how similar the arrangement of genes along their chromosome is. Uh, skipping over, thus it is possible that any similarity in gene order might be a function of both, both chimps and humans need. If the sequence similarity is due to function, then it need not indicate common ancestry. Synonymous coding use is a complicated subject and I'm going to skip over just to mention if you're interested, the book is there. Chromosomal fu fusion, when chimpanzee and human genomes are compared, our chromosome 2 appears to be a fusion of two chimpanzee chromosomes. The argument is made that this demonstrates our common ancestry with chimpanzees. However, the junction where the supposed fusion uh, took place is not made of typical telomeric se sequences. Telomeres are special sequences found at the end of the chromosomes. Instead, degenerate sequences are found, sequences found elsewhere in the genome, but not associated with breaks or fusions. The designer as a deceiver. This argument goes something like this. If there's an intelligent designer, then why did he make it look like things evolve? That makes him a deceiver. And actually, that's probably the single biggest argument. There is a logical flaw here as well. It is stated as fact that things look like they evolved by natural processes. But things do not look like they evolved. As, and this is continuing with that paragraph. Um, as has been shown, many good reasons to believe things were designed, uh, yeah, many good thing reasons to believe things were designed are found in molecular biology. There are also many examples from the design of larger scale structures like the eye of word, uh, like an eye or a bird's wing. Even the, even the complementary and interlocking nature of the biosphere all give evidence of design. In fact, biologists are continually told that they must remember that things only look designed, they really aren't. And that reference, by the way, is to River Out of Eden by Dawkins. That clearly means the designer is not a deceiver. He has made it so that everyone can detect his design. I'm going to come back to that. Population, genetics, and Adam and Eve. This argument is presented in the next chapter, so next week be prepared for that. Conclusions. The preponderance of the evidence says that we humans have a unique origin. 
First, arguments from chapter one, chapters 1 through 14 show that neo-Darwinism cannot explain the information-bearing, complex, and specified nature of life, and that common descent is a flawed hypothesis. Then in this chapter, we've demonstrated that neo-Darwinism cannot account for the specific patterns we see in our genomes, and that common ancestry of chimps and humans is questionable. The amount and kinds of differences in our DNA cannot be accounted for in the proposed evolutionary time available, at least not by random methods. The apparently purposeful placement of repeated elements like signs and lines, plus their important roles in species-specific differences, argue against an unguided process of common descent. The sheer amazing complexity of gene regulation and chromosome interactions argue for brilliant design. Our anatomical and physiological differences would require many specific coordinated changes, changes that could not happen without guidance. But most importantly, more importantly, if things like synteny, shared codon use, and pseudogenes can be explained functionally, the argument for common descent deteriorates and a unique origin becomes more likely. The chief question asked about human evolution is this. Are we descended from an ape-like ancestor or are we unique with a distinct origin? In the contents, context of this book, of course, this question is paramount. One of the reasons people tend to become theistic evolutionists is precisely because they consider the evidence based on genetic similarity for our descent from an ape-like ancestor to be incontrovertible. We have presented arguments here that indicate that the evidence for chimp and human common ancestry may not be so incontrovertible after all, and that in light of our basic ignorance of the way our genome functions and in the light of the increasing evidence for human-specific design, the rewriting of theology is a bad idea. But coming back to theistic evolution is not really good. Let us now review the overall arguments we are making and where we are so far in brief. Chapter 14 shows that the fossil record does not support the idea of a continuous evolution between a chimpanzee-like ancestor and us. This chapter shows that our genetic differences are far greater than have been commonly reported and that they reveal many functionally significant uniquely human changes. There are too many such changes to have happened by random mutation and selection. In the next chapter, we will examine whether the claim that we have come from a starting population of at least several thousand is necessarily true. We will report ways to distinguish between that idea and the possibility that we may have come from a single pair, Adam and Eve, and we will describe a new population genetics model that may allow us to test the two possibilities to see which best corresponds with the actual genetic data we have. Now, my take on this chapter. First, I think the chapter makes a good case that we are not 99% chimpanzee. True number is somewhat uh, south of 95%. Human-specific genes are critical and are not really well accounted for by evolution. The arrangement of key regulatory parts of the genome is more important than the similarity of building blocks. Uh, what we've seen is 99% is really cherry-picking. Um, there has not been enough time for the required changes. And finally, the argument from shared mistakes is weak because you have to establish their mistakes first, and that has not been done. The chapter mentions the difference between the chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes. This could have received more attention. Um, there's a reference that uh, some of you may remember, um, and there's a one version of a talk that I've given on that specific article. Uh, perhaps more, most importantly, the argument that God would be a deceiver if he did not use a process of evolution is really nonsensical. Strictly speaking, this argument belongs in section one of part one because it's uh, an argument about uh, how evolution in general is true, but it is used to back common ancestry of humans and apes um, and therefore, we'll consider it here. Francis Crick, quote, uh, quote from What Mad Pursuit, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Why? Because it looks designed, and you really have to deny the evidence of your, of your eyes. Uh, Richard Dawkins, three quotes, biology is a study of complicated things that have the appearance of having been designed with a purpose. You've 
probably seen that before. The illusion of purpose is so powerful that biologists themselves use the assumption of good design as a working tool. Maybe it's real. So powerful is the illusion of design it took humanity until the mid-19th century to realize that it is an illusion. Or maybe the eggheads to be able to deny reality in front of them. Um, the appearance is, is there. You can't get away from it. And then of course, G.G. Simpson, a, telefo a telescope, telephone, or a typewriter, is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Obviously, its manufacturer had a purpose in mind, and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. It, too, looks as if it had been made for a purpose. This appearance of purposefulness is pervading in nature, in the general structure of animals and plants, in the mechanism of their various organs, and in the give and take of their relationships with each other. It looks designed. Accounting for this apparent purposefulness is a basic problem for any system of philosophy or of science. Unless the system of philosophy or of science starts out by assuming that it looks designed because it is, in which case it's a basic advantage for that system. But that's my opinion, not your turn. I'm just curious how Dawkins this illusion of design how he pursues that and articulates it I mean I guess I guess his point is that randomly it it achieved that purpose right is that is that the so therefore, it's all random, so th th there's no design, but somehow it came together and, and was functional. Well, the way he would explain it is the, the randomness was in the creation itself. Natural selection selected out the good ones, which then randomly mutated again, and then it selected out the even better ones, and then... Uh, uh, another round happened, and uh, there were perhaps thousands. Well, to be precise, the, if there are three billion genes and it's 95 percent the same, uh, then there were literally millions of changes that were selected out. But he's, he's between starting in the middle of the argument because he's not addressing gene. How uh, genes came? So it's. I mean, that's that's to me part of the big problem that. The biologist, they start in the middle. Yes, yes. Uh, but you see, if you don't, if you don't start in the middle, that means you have to start at the beginning. What that means is that the origin of life, if the origin of life could not have happened naturalistically, then this whole rest of it is a waste of time. Do that? I mean, it seems like you've got to struggle with that to begin with. Well, see, they, they go with the part that they can kind of sort of explain if you look at it just right. So why are we giving them any credence at all? <laughs> That's a good question. I suppose the reason why is because they are scientists and everybody knows that scientists are the wisest people around. I, I think that's the basic, basic <laughs> argument that's being used. Uh, comment here and then uh, back up there. Go ahead. Yeah, really good chapter. Uh, I found the arguments uh, compelling, but I was almost overwhelmed by the one on the amount of time required for establishing a uh, mutation in a population. Six million years to establish one mutation. I mean, how can you argue against... Uh, Two million years puts you at um, maybe 82 if you look at it just right. It's... Uh, 
this mutation has to stay while these other mutations well, well uh, you, you, uh, you're, you're correct about that however the, the thing about that is that if the, the mutation gets you to a spot where it's actually selected for then it could stay see the problem is that you right. can think of it as kind of little uh, valleys that you get sunk into <laughs> And if uh, some jiggling takes place, you can climb to uh, over one mutation. It takes a whole lot of jiggling to get you over two mutations. And if you have 300 genes that are totally brand new that you need, and, and those are, mm -hmm. what, genes of, let's say, 300 um, base pairs, now you have to go 300 bases before you get in there. That makes no sense whatsoever. Even the essential trait mm -hmm. is but not protected from being mutated. Yeah, that's right. But the one thing of it is that if all the mutations die off or, or don't reproduce very well, then you'll be okay. Um, you know, once you get to the hole, you can kind of stay there. The problem is that, I mean, you can mostly stay there. Most of the offspring will not mutate that particular one because if they do, then they have to come up onto the mountain again. But the problem is that that there are places where the, the, the high plateau that you have to cross is like, you know, hundreds of steps, literally. And, and to, to say that you can cross over there with no problem whatsoever, it's just it makes very little sense. And then you, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, and then you've got a, the, the problem of maybe only one mutation out of a thousand. That's a generous figure. Is useful. Yes. Uh, and genetic entropy in there. How in the world are you going to get that thing to? Exp yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's right. That's one, one in a thousand, maybe one in a million. I mean, we're being generous. That's maybe a very generous thousand. figure yeah, I gave there. Uh, how in the world are you going to get through you know, all the maze of bad mutations you have to put up with there? Yeah. Uh, this is genetic entropy, of course, but it's, but it's all part of this picture. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I've been wondering throughout this presentation, how many different mammalian genomes have been, uh, different species have been completely uh, described? I don't know the answer to that. Certainly the rodents used in laboratory experiments. Yeah, been, right, I, I'm mus musculus, I'm sure and it's been uh, doesn't, Isn't the pig DNA completely sequenced? Um, Uh, probably, although I don't know for sure. Mike, I'm asking these questions because it's interesting, although perhaps readily understandable, that the only comparison is made between chimps and humans. Now, if uh, chimps and mice, I'm um, pardon me, if humans and mice were 90% similar, that would cast this whole argument in a totally different light. In other words, much of the similarity is necessary because of the commonality of function. Yes. I wonder if that has ever been addressed. Well, you run into some really interesting things. Okay, one of them is that there are areas in humans mm -hmm. and in mice that are virtually identical, even though they don't code for protein and their non-coding function is not understood. And evolution scratch their head, and sometimes they will say, well, they must have some function, because otherwise they couldn't have preserved this uh, similarity over literally hundreds of millions of years. So there must be some function. We just don't know what it is. Um, and uh, then there are... Um, then there are other 
uh, things that, uh, for example, some of the human-specific genes have flat out been denied by uh, evolutionary biologists uh, of certain stripe because humans are too closely res uh, related to chimpanzees and they couldn't have had these new genes in the uh, amount of evolutionary time possible. So even though it looks like they code for protein, the protein must not be important because if it were, then evolutionary theory would be wrong. Um, and I, I mean, there are people who who uh, take those open reading frames out of the count of of uh, human genomes uh, because there's no parallel, and therefore they couldn't be important. Which is an interesting way of arguing. You know that that raises an interesting question. Creation scientists may have a jump on the rest of the population because we kind of expect that those things might be important. And it would be interesting to run the protein that's, co uh, that's coded for, make antibodies against it, and then try to see where it is expressed, maybe in certain stages of the embryo or something like that, and find what its function really is. We will be going by Dawkins' rule that uh, that it looks so designed that you can use design as a as a methodological way of finding stuff. <laughs> even, even though course, even though you don't believe in it, even though you don't believe in it. Oh. Well, Dawkins defies logic over and over and over again. If you make certain assumptions, he makes perfect sense. And actually, one of the things I like about Dawkins is he is really clear about how he approaches things. Yes, that's true. Uh, a related question. Uh, n no one um, in this discussion, DNA repair has not come up. And the ad attempt to conserve the most important functional sequences uh, when they change. So important if these genes are really important for the species then there should be i would think logically very special mechanisms to get rid of changes when they happen by dna repair has that line of approach been addressed i wouldn't be able to tell you well Somehow, I think if if it had been clearly, you'd be aware of it. But I'm I'm not into that literature. But the failure when making a comparison between uh, chimps and humans to bring in other mammals to me is huge. Well, if it helps you any, you may remember that the uh, absolute sequence differences in chimps and humans in the Y chromosome is like thirty percent. And the only way you can get 70% out of the rest of it is by taking this piece of human and rearranging it the other way, and then this piece and rearranging it, and then sticking them together. So then you can get 70% that lines up, mostly. And it lines up maybe 98 99% if you do it that way. Um, but the whole chromosome is disorganized, as we've talked about before. The interesting thing is... They have now done uh, gorillas. And gorillas, the raw sequence data is 85%, which means we're men are more closely related to gorillas than chimpanzees. But the women always knew that anyway. Uh, <laughs> Question, uh, aren't some Go ahead, of, and then... Uh, aren't some of those sequences... Uh, in order of usage on the chromosome, when you start flipping them around... What does this do to this system? Well, it depends on which ones. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, and then we want to pass the mic up. Go ahead. Um, basic question of mechanics. You were talking earlier about um, how 
if you randomly mutate a gene, okay, that's in the same sequence. But if you're going to add a new gene, I guess I don't know and understand how that could randomly occur when you're copying a, a sequence without like gumming up the mechanism of having an extra group in there. How would you insert something new into there that's not in the same, um, I don't know even how to explain what I'm trying to ask because it seems like if you're lengthening the, the sequence and you're trying to make the copy there, that lengthening or, or adding something new in, would the whole thing would be off and then it wouldn't be able to copy. Um, I don't know the answer to that, except to say that it rarely does happen. And I think that there was one point in which they were saying that the differences, uh, the, the number of times you have insertions, deletions, maybe of one or two bases, maybe of um, one or two thousand bases, it does happen occasionally. And in fact, um, there is a condition in which you can take an entire chromosome and duplicate it so that you, instead of you having two chromosomes, you have three. The most famous one being chromosome 21, which if you have trisomy 21, um, you have Down syndrome, which from an evolutionary point of view is not an improvement. Um, which goes to show you that dose matters. Two chromosomes are fine, three chromosomes are too many. Same thing is true. Uh, humans get by, uh, human females get by with two X chromosomes. Um, you take one of them out, they have Turner syndrome, and they're infertile. You put in three, they have super female, but they're uh, mental status is not good. You have uh, human uh, humans with XY chromosomes, they do fine. Uh, there are a few humans around with XXY, their Klinefelter syndrome, they don't do well. They're not very smart. You have uh, humans with XYY chromosomes, double Y. Um, they tend to disproportionately populate our jails. You always knew that about men, but. <laughs> yes. A question. My son and I were talking about the orphan gene uh -huh. and trying to understand it. This lecture today, and I scare myself now because I'm beginning to understand things. This lecture today, is that related at all to the orphan gene that's uh, specific to species? Yes. Uh, well, not all of it, but some of it is. Yes. Uh, when they talk about the new genes that came up that are in humans, that are not in chimpanzees, and that there are, depending on who you're counting, 300 of them, or, or uh, the, there, there are a few of them that are totally brand new, like about, I think, what, 60 of them that have no species-specific. Uh, species and so, uh, species specific and orphan are basically the same okay, thing. Okay, that's what I wondered. And the other thing is, I listened to Stephen Meyer being interviewed the other day, and a very good interview. And he ended up saying at the end there are intelligent design for short Earth, around 10,000 years, he said, and then older. And he said, I'm in the older end of it. Yeah. And now he's written a book that's coming out soon, Return of the God Hypothesis. So I can't wait to get that and see where he ends up in that book. Well, you know, as I said before, some of these people are moving targets. And so don't pin them down to their past belief and shoot at them. Uh, you may not be being fair. No, I, yeah, I've learned that well from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, comment here. My curiosity and question is about the uh, uh, disease uh, genes. Um, God created us, we're perfect. Where did, where did that come in and how did that come in? And, and does everybody that has uh, a certain type of gene get that disease? Well, 
I, you know, I'm launching into total speculation at this point, so take what I say with a grain of salt, actually several grains of salt. Uh, but in, the, in Revelation, it talks about the tree of life, which is for the, heal- the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Presumably, there's something in those leaves that makes a difference. And I don't know whether it goes in and uh, re- reboots the GNA, uh, you know, the, the genes, or whether it uh, uh, makes them ineffectual and replaces them in some other way, or whether there, you know, it is something that God says, well, if you eat this, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You know, it's flat out miraculous. Um, but. Yeah, and I don't know what kind of procedure w- one is going to have in the new year- new Earth. I-, I presume you'll still have some kind of gravity because th- if you don't have something like that, you know, uh, life becomes totally disorganized. Uh, but uh, but exactly what the rules are is not clear. What we do know is that some of the rules are different, uh, and specifically, you don't need the sun. And one of the other rules is true, is that you don't have to die. Uh, How that's done, I don't know. Um, You know, one of the nice things about uh, heaven is that I'll be able to quit my job in medicine and I'll be able to start research instead. (laughs) Well, so I would say you wouldn't even have to, I mean, you could argue that God made a self-perpetuating, self-correcting machine without even a tree of life. I, I would say for with epigenetics now, so I would say selfishness and isolation could influence gene expression too and create problems. Uh, and so how far that would go, I don't know. But yeah. you, you could also have a line of reasoning from an epigenetic standpoint of our choices influencing our genetics expression. Yeah. He, those those early those early uh, giants on the earth, uh, one living nearly to a thousand years, and I mean the long lives they lived. Yeah. So they the the disease thing may not have been uh, until they started doing things that would bring on. Uh, disease, but yeah. then from well, the meat flood eating. on, it's different. One of the odd things, in, in addition to the talk about the leaves of the healing of the nations, is in the original. God says, "Now they have taken of the tree of knowledge and of evil, uh, good and evil, and if they we maybe they're going to eat the tree of life and, and live, live forever." And so He said, "We can't have that." So He sent them out. Well, the angels, LOI talks about the angels thought that. And so it, it, they were afraid of that. Do you remember reading that? Or uh, uh, The way I interpreted it was it was really the, he was um, act, kind of acknowledging the angels' concern and it might not have been an actual thing. Well, that's how I interpret that, that statement I read. You know, unfortunately, we don't, we can't go back and do a controlled experiment where people eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then eat of the tree of life and see what happens. Um, we, we're we're totally, uh, you know, without, um, shall we call it, scientific evidence. Uh, so at this point, we really can't say. Uh, and you know, you. I guess you make up the theory that makes most sense to you, but I think the one thing we have to do when we're doing that is be really careful and acknowledge that even though this theory makes some sense to me, that it doesn't maybe explain everything and that and that we don't really know how it happened. And, uh, uh, you know, I, th- I think that uh, the profession of ignorance is, uh, in this particular case, warranted. Well, anyway, uh, come back next week and we'll uh, delve into was there a real Adam and Eve?